So I want to expand a little bit more on, you know, who you are, trying to figure out who you are and where that means you're going to fall into the world of spirituality. Last time I talked about the fact that some people do not have spiritual experiences. They have limited interaction with their spirits. About 20% of the population have extraordinarily limited interaction with their own spirits or with the spirit world. About 20% of the people have extreme, common, everyday, or at least very frequent, powerful interactions with the spiritual world, to varying extents. And then there's the middle, who have some spiritual experiences sometime. Many of them are very interested in spirituality. They are curious about it. They want to develop this spirituality. They want to see more of this world, or at least they want to be able to protect themselves from the world if their experiences were negative cultivate good stuff if their experiences were positive, and just generally live in healthful interaction with that spiritual world that is to them a bit of a mystery. And that this forms up the three different approaches to spirituality that are out there. And so obviously if you, if it's all symbolic to you, you're going to be drawn more and more towards dogma and philosophy. If it's very, very immediately real, you're going to want real results quick, determ you know, reliable, teachable, reproducible results for dealing with this stuff that is flying in your face. If you're in the middle, you have a lot more room to play and have fun and not worry about it as much. It's not a foolishness and it's not an immediate concern. So you can be very creative and artistic in the middle. So what are some of the other things? Well, you are a spirit and you have a body. When you have that relationship, uh, when you realize that your consciousness, your actual awareness, your, your awareness and your point of focus are external to your body. They're not actually in your mind. But you do have a brain, and your brain has neurological circuitry, and you do respond to chemicals released in the brain, and that's your body, and it has nothing to do with your, well, it has very minimal things to do with your spirit. It is very much analogy-wise like you are a person riding a horse. You have a horse. You have a pet horse, which is your body. You know, people used to say your body is your temple. Um, and people forgot what that meant. That actually meant something that was pretty accurate once upon a time. And that information has been deliberately suppressed. So now it doesn't make any sense. Your body is your temple. You know, that sounds like an invitation to absolute narcissism. It's actually... A very accurate statement, it's just we forgot what it was supposed to mean. So perhaps better now to say your body is your horse. Your horse is your means to get around. It is your means to work. It is your. It is a powerful friend that helps you survive and function in your world and opens it up and gives it access to things that you would never have access to without that horse. But your horse is also an animal. It really wants to just be eating grass. It wants to stop along the table and nibble that juicy edible it sees. It wants to roll in dust. It wants to scrape you off on the tree limb and knock you to the ground so it can run back to the barn and get some hay. It wants to sniff butts. It wants to, you know, do horse things. It's going to spook. You know, if something startles it, it's going to spook. This is something you have to deal with if you're interacting with a horse. Well, you have that same relationship. Your spirit with your body has that same relationship. Your body is an animal, and it's going to do animally things, and it's kind of, you know, got these neurons that do function in a certain way, and it's going to do that whether you like it or not. And so you can train your horse, you can develop a relationship with your horse, you can get your horse to function, you know, you can get your horse bomb-proof where it will not spook too much on you and it will go through difficulties and you can work with it. But it's still a horse and it's still going to have emotions and feelings and impacts from these things on its own and you are got to be aware of that. So what are some of these things that are the problem? Well, one of these things is that evolutionarily you have a great benefit if you oversimplify things and look at things not how they are, but if you look for patterns that are going to benefit you for survival. What's food? What's sexy? Safety? Where, where am I safe from predators? Your biology is hard programmed to preserve yourself 
through this sort of observation. And so before anything ever comes into your conscious mind, it's already being edited where a lot of stuff that is true is being excluded and only stuff that heightens your chances of survival are, is being highlighted and is being passed through as information. Now, people have this to varying intensity. Some people, that's a real issue for them. That, that's all the way they can see the world. Other people, a little bit more of the truth can kind of start to bleed through. And this becomes a personality trait where so you are on a, everyone in the, uh, in the human race is on a spectrum somewhere in a preference. You either have a preference for happiness and things that me have meaning to you that make you emotionally secure, that validate you, that make you feel part of a community, that make you feel good. And you don't really care about the truth. The truth is reasonably as what well irrelevant if you are feeling edified and important and safe and comfortable and at some level of advantage. Conversely, there's some of us who we want the truth and do we want it more than we care about whether it's comfortable. Now, this creates another one of these spectrums, just as the spectrum I talked about last time. This makes another spectrum. This is actually on the Myers-Briggs personality test, which is a series of four different spectrums that kind of give you a sense of who you are as a person. And this is the third criteria on that test. And so, would you prefer to the truth and emotions be damned, which is one extreme, or do you prefer to feel comfortable and safe and everything certain and secure and happy and the truth can go screw itself? You, you are willing to lie to yourself to feel good. Now, most of us are somewhere in the middle. On the test, when I took the test, the Myers-Briggs test, I was actually right pretty much smack dead in the middle. I, I split the difference. I have equal interest in the truth and in feeling emotionally satisfied. That's average. I am insanely average on that regard. Uh, you are also somewhere on that spectrum, and you either prefer the truth or you prefer comfortable lies. And so that's going to influence where you want to look spiritually. If you prefer comfortable lies, you're going to like things like dogma. You're going to like things that focus on building community. You're going to like to focus on things that edify you and make you feel good, even if they're not specifically or particularly true. You're going to like things that improve your chances of survival, even if they're not necessarily particularly accurate or, or real. So this is very much organized religion. Is That's what it kind of specializes in. That middle section, the kind of animism and ancestral uh, interaction, uh, they can also do that too to, to a large extent because there's a lot of people there and they have a tendency to form communities and it can be very uh, edifying and so on. But there's it does, lacks the structure that really gives you that sort of solidity. A lot of those people that are uncertain. They like structure. They like rules. They like laws. They like to know where they stand. They like the illusion of certainty. That's part of what makes them feel comfortable. The more you like the illusion of certainty, the more you're willing to ignore the truth, which is that everything is horribly uncertain, uh, the more you're going to like something highly structured like an organized religion. The more you're comfortable with the truth, the more you're going to want the truth over that comfort the more you're going to be driven towards having a personal experience. So that's one thing to know about yourself. And you can actually go and take the Myers-Briggs personality test, and it's the third criteria on the test, and you can actually get a percentage of which, which one you are, which one, which one you are more or less. And that's going to tell you kind of where you want to steer, whether you want to go personal or whether you want to go organizational. Uh, another thing that, uh, that's worthy of consideration is how do you react to being afraid, or of strange things, strange information, the weirdness of the world. When your body encounters weirdness, and it's looking for patterns that are in its advantage, and it says something's wrong, it triggers a fear response. This happens before you can think about it. It happens to everybody. It happens to me. It happens to everybody. The thing is, then, that there's a difference between the fear response, the biological, physical fear response, the release of epinephrine uh, and, and very you know, adrenaline epinephrine to trigger a fear response, and emotional fear. So there's kind of a question here that you, you will encounter fear. When you encounter the strange, you will experience fear. 
But then do you have emotional fear, the emotions of fear, which are marked by a series of, uh, of emotional states very similar to the Kubler-Ross five stages of grief? That's actually, a, that is one fear response. That's a particular long-term fear response. So when you trigger fear, emotional fear, you start with denial, you might get angry, you might try bargaining and negotiating. It's all about pushing things away. There's a rejection element to fear. But there's a lot of other emotions. You have a lot of other emotions as a human. And if you can turn off fear and experience any of the other emotions, uh, you can do all kinds of different things. And you're going to be more interested in, you know, desire or love or play and humor or curiosity and thinking. These are other emotional circuits that are in the body, having subset emotions underneath each one of them or certain patterns uh, associated with each one of them. If you can turn off fear, you're going to be very good and you're going to probably be happier on a personal path. If you cannot turn off fear, you're going to be drawn more towards an organized path that is designed to either manipulate you with fear or to try to allay your fears that as long as you're good, you have nothing to fear, and so you can just turn the fear off. And really, if, as long as you're good, you, can, you don't have anything to fear. That's a form of psychological abuse, but it's very appealing to certain people who have certain levels of emotional maturity. So those are things to bear in mind too. Is it, you know where? How do you react to the strange when something weird comes along? Do you freak out and run screaming, uh, or are do you get curious, or do you make a joke, or do you want to know more, or you want something, you, you know whatever. It, the more you have other emotions besides fear, the more successful you will be with a direct personal spirituality. The more you experience fear, the more you want to avoid direct spiritual personality because fear makes you vulnerable. And so you really want to avoid that being afraid in, in the direct face of, of spirits is not a good concept. So you're far better off with the, you know, the sterilized, purified, you know, organized dogmatic version of things that keeps you feeling safe and happy and not triggering fear you're going to be far more happy in that direction you won't accomplish as much but you'll be far more happy in that direction so these are things to bear in mind what matters you to you more feeling good or the truth what how do you react to the strange fear or other emotions do you have the ability to set fear aside and feel other emotions along with how much do you actually experience the spiritual world? Is it in your face or is it something you've never experienced? And these things that, that tells you a little bit about where you want to go into these three areas. You know, are you on the personal path that you really need to deal with this directly and, and individually and right now? Are you on the avoidance path where you just want structure and some reasonable explanations and you want to feel calm and comfortable and, and certain about things? Or are you in the middle where you want some company, you, know, you want some society, some community, some belonging, you want to have a party, you want to have some fun, but you also want to really feel like you're connecting with the spirits and actually accomplishing something. You're right in the middle. You want a little of both. So that tells you a little bit where to steer.